Let's uh, pray before we dig in here this morning. Father, we just come before you now. We ask that you would uh, quiet our hearts, open our eyes. Lord, as we look to this uh, scripture this morning, may it speak deeply. May it challenge us, transform us, convict us. Lord, we just pray that the baggage that we came in with, that we could just kind of put it on pause right now and set it down and just draw our attention to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're still playing with the sign out front, putting different uh, things. If you notice the sign, uh, it just says this, hashtag. That's a hashtag if you don't know what a hashtag is. Does anyone not know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, so a hashtag is the tic-tac-toe sign or the pound sign or it's that number on your phone that's not a number that you, you, know, that you can push when you're in voicemail or something and they tell you to hit the, you know, the, the pound sign. I'm wondering when they're going to say hit the hashtag because it's really taken over. So the idea of a hashtag is on the internet, you can go onto Twitter and you can, and Twitter is a phenomenon, uh, communication, social media thing, but you can go onto Twitter and you can say hashtag something and other people can say the same thing and you can start kind of a conversation thread on the internet. So I wanted to put a hashtag thing out on the sign, but the church sign company didn't give us any hashtags. <laughs> that says something, uh, doesn't it? It says that they're not thinking current culture to not include something as often used as a hashtag. So I put this hashtag up. I created a Twitter account for the church, uh, and I, I put a post there. I didn't see anybody respond to it, but, um, but it's there. Uh, I'm going to watch when I'm going through the sermon to make sure that nobody's hashtagging and you know, tweeting and, and everything. But I, get, but I don't know. I guess that's okay. <clears throat> I tell my students, if you want to play with your phone, go ahead. I have a watch that tells me text messages, and I read it when they don't know it. Um, my life is like Mission Impossible. Do you ever feel that way? Your life is like Mission Impossible. Maybe, maybe the word mission really isn't part of it. Maybe it's more of the highlighted in yellow life impossible. That, that you're wrestling with a life that just seems to be impossible, and maybe it's even lacking mission, lacking some kind of a passionate something to drive you forward each day, to cause you to get out of bed running each day. Um, so when I think about the whole idea, this idea of mission impossible, you know, we have to kind of think a little bit about mission impossible. in on your vacation. Well, Mr. Hunt, I don't quite know where to begin. You know? No. Should I? She's got no training for this kind of thing. Welcome to Australia, mate. This ain't funny. mother of all nightmares is on the loose. I don't think I can do it. I mean, it'll be difficult. Yeah. Well, this is not mission difficult, Mr. Hunt. It's mission impossible. Difficult to be a walk in the park for you. You gotta be kidding. Uh, 
This message will destruct in five seconds. So perhaps you're like me and you grew up with Mission Impossible with uh, James Phelps for me, not, not uh, Ethan. And things have changed an awful lot too, haven't they? I mean, the first Mission Impossible had a self-destruct 33 size LP record that kind of dissolved on the record player. And then they moved to reel to reel and then they moved to cassette, kind of a cassette player uh, later on. And now, I don't know if you caught it, but he just takes out a pair of glasses and puts them on the reverse of the screen. He sees everything in the glasses self-destruct in five seconds. And boy, technology just changes everything. Mission Impossible. Um, what can we say about, about this guy, Ethan? Um, Ethan Hunt is the new, on all of the different movies, he's the, the Jim Phelps. And um, you know, maybe not a big fan of Tom Cruise. I heard somebody you know, say, let him, <laughs> let him die. But when you look at his character, when you look at Ethan Hunt, there are some things that you just have to realize is going on, okay? So the story begins in, in Mission Impossible 2, and I chose this one for a reason, but in, in Mission Impossible 2, the story begins with this, in a biotech lab in Australia where a scientist develops a, both a deadly virus and a cure. If you're infected with this virus, if you don't get the cure within 20 hours, there is no cure. So there's this suspenseful element added to the storyline of Mission Impossible 2 where if you, if you were infected, you have 20 hours to get a cure or, um, well, or that's that. Uh, so anyways, this scientist realizing the potential danger reaches out to Ethan Hunt for help. He wants to get protection and so he's tricked into traveling to Atlanta with the virus and with the cure. Uh, and while he's on the plane, he thinks he's with Ethan Hunt, but it's one of those mask things and it's not Ethan Hunt. And, and uh, so they're on the plane with the scientist and he's got the virus and he's got the cure and then the oxygen bags drop down from the thing because pressure is dropped in the, in the plane for some reason and everybody puts on a mask, but everybody who puts on a mask is drugged and everybody on the plane just kind of gets knocked out and then the pilot you know they're on the mask and they get knocked out and uh, the Ethan Hunt look-alike pulls off the mask jumps out of the plane with his uh, with his with his helpers and, and 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 the guy the scientist and everybody else on the plane crashes into a fiery ball into a mountain it was intense that was all in the first five minutes of the movie. <laughs> Meanwhile, the real Ethan, he's on vacation, rock climbing, as you saw in the trailer that I played. He's on the, you know, this mountain hiking and uh, climbing up to the top of this mountain and then a helicopter flies overhead, you know, and he's like, what are you guys doing here? And they shoot some kind of a missile-like thing at him. And, digs into the ground at his feet, but it's really just a fuselage that, that he flips open and he takes out those glasses that you saw and he puts them on. And then you hear these words, good morning, Mr. Hunt. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, but as always, if any member of your forces are captured or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. And we grew up, I grew up with that, and, and you've probably seen the movie, some of the, the younger people may have seen the movie, and then of course the message will self-destruct in you know, five seconds. They only give you five seconds now, it was like 30 seconds, I think, in the, in the beginning of the show. So suddenly, Ethan, he's, suddenly he's on a mission. Ethan knows he's on a mission. And, 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 and he has to know that he's on a mission because in this mission, during this movie, relationships are put at risk. He's continuously, his life is continuously at risk. He repels down some kind of ventilation shaft and doesn't get crushed by the doors that are timing. Oh, uh, he's in danger of being exposed to the virus constantly. He's shot by, uh, multiple, at, by multiple people with automatic weapons. There's, why would he do this? He's on a mission. We understand that. He's on a mission. So he goes through hardship. We, we see that, 
excuse me, that he jumps out of a building, that there's some serious, really serious hand-to-hand -hand combat going on, and his hair never, ever even gets, like, messed. Uh, he, he, goes, he goes into the enemy, you know, layer, you know, he, he goes into the enemy risking, risking it all, and, and there's a lot of explosions and gunfire and motorcycle chases and car chases and all in the suspense of this deadline of this 20 hours because someone who he's kind of fallen in love with in the first five minutes of the movie uh, has been infected with this virus. In fact, she actually inoculated herself with the virus because she was acting sacrificially. Oh, it's amazing. And, and in the end, in the end, the girl is saved and the virus is destroyed. Mission accomplished. It's pretty intense. I mean, didn't I just, did I just paint a good picture, a good kind of synopsis of Mission Impossible 2, that it's a real mission, that, that there's risk involved, that there's hardship involved, that all of these things are involved? Have, uh, and so I guess I ask the question, have you ever been on a mission? Have you? Have you ever been on a mission? Maybe, uh, maybe you've watched the Blues Brothers. They were on a mission, right? They were on a mission from God. <laughs> Maybe you've been on a mission for a diploma, you know, to get through school, to graduate. Maybe, you, maybe you've been on a mission uh, for a relationship. You know, Annie and I have been on a mission for 33 years to have a better marriage every year. You know? And, and, and when we're working hard at that, and, and it's a good thing. And, just, and so we go on missions. When we see someone in a relationship that, we, that we're attracted to, we go on a mission. And people do all kinds of crazy things on a mission when there's a relationship involved. Have you ever been on a mission um, career-wise, a, a salary, a, you know, a certain position, a certain rank. Have you, have you ever been on a mission you know, to get through boot camp? Have you ever been on a mission to, to get somewhere? Have you ever been on a mission? What was that passion and drive like? What was it to wake up in the morning and say, I've got this to do and I have to do it and there is no choice? You're on a mission. Maybe you've been on a mission of the different kind. Maybe you're on a mission to get revenge. Maybe you're on a mission to hurt somebody else. Maybe, maybe you're on a mission. Maybe you're on a mission like this guy, Paul. Now, I don't know if that's what Paul looks like. I don't know if that's really what Paul looks like. That's what Hugh Jackman looks like. Did you know Hugh Jackman is starring, they're filming right now, a, a full-blown Hollywood movie called The Apostle Paul? It was supposed to be out in 2017. It was supposed to be out this year. It's been moved to 2019. I can't wait to see what they do with that. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon are involved in the production of it. Um, Hugh Jackman actually has said that, that he wants this to be his gift to God, that this acting would be a, 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 his gift to God. I can't wait to see this movie. But Paul... Paul is on a mission. If we kind of look at, at, at where Paul is, you know, the story begins, not in Australia, in some lab, biotech lab, but the story begins 160 miles northeast of Jerusalem on a road leading to Damascus. We've been talking about that. Uh, a cure to a virus is being distributed by the church. People are being healed. People are being helped. Socially, people are changing. There's, there's great things happening. The gospel is being heard. People are entering into a, a saving relationship with Christ. People are selling their property. People are giving you know, the proceeds to people. People are, are, are acting out of a loving, caring way. It's a different kind of mission. Uh, you know, these people are on a different kind of mission. They're not, they're not seeking to uh, gain the accomplishment of the mission through violence. They, and yet this guy, Paul, he's using violence as the way of accomplishing his mission. He's on a mission. But then something changes. Paul is persecuting the church and then he's 
blinded by a light on the Damascus Road. We've been talking about that last week. He gets knocked off of his horse. He can't see for three days. He's praying. This guy Ananias uh, is praying, and, and there's this friend request from an enemy that, that happens, and, and, and Ananias goes to Paul, and, 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 and Ananias says, Brother Saul, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to take this message to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish, the Gentile is just a word for non-Jewish people, so take this message outside of Judaism, take this message, that's your mission, God has given you this mission, and so Paul is on a mission, and we find ourselves in the scripture today of Acts chapter 9, verses 20 to 31, 11 verses, and we're going to travel over these 11 verses at least 11 years of time, at least 11 years of time happen right here in these 11 verses that we're going to talk about. And would never know it if you were just reading Acts by itself. Reading Acts just by itself, you'd think, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. There's 11 years of time in all of this that we're covering today. So what happens? We find that at once he began to preach at the synagogue. That's Paul. At once, Paul begins to preach at the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, all of those who heard him were astonished and asked. At once, Luke writes, he goes to preach at the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this is an important thing. If we go back to what Luke writes in his gospel, what was the final thing that brought Jesus uh, to being uh, crucified? They said to him, are you the Son of God? Jesus said yes, and the high priests and the Sanhedrin, the council, they all said, what more evidence do we need? We've heard it from his own lips. And that begins the process of him being brought to the cross and crucified for us. So isn't it interesting that Luke decides to put this as the very first thing that Paul says? Is he stirring the crowd up right now by saying this? You bet he is. By saying that Jesus is the Son of God, he's saying the very thing that got Jesus condemned. And so he's stirring things up. All those who heard him were astonished, and they said, isn't... Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among, among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them prisoners of chief things? They all know that Paul came to arrest people, that he came with papers allowing him to arrest people, that everybody is on edge and he's the enemy. And now they're all shocked and they're amazed because here he is in a synagogue proclaiming Christ to be Lord. Proclaiming Christ to be the Son of God. I wonder if Paul connected what God was doing. The first temple that existed that was destroyed uh, before the Babylonian exile, after that temple was destroyed, they set up a synagogue system. There were synagogues all around at different locations for worship because there was no temple. After the temple was rebuilt, uh, and that's where they are now in the second temple time period, after the temple was rebuilt, you'd think they'd get rid of the synagogues, but they didn't. Why did they continue to meet at the synagogues? Why did they continue to be the place of influence, the place of debate, the place where the ideas were exchanged? Changed. The, the synagogue remained to be this, this key place in society. I wonder if Paul put it all together when he started to preach in the synagogue because that was Jesus' practice, that was his disciples' practice, that was Paul's practice to go in the synagogue first. I wonder if, they, if Paul at this moment put it together that God had put together a network of systems to transmit the gospel to all different places where there were people to hear, places of influence, the exchange of ideas, debate, all of that. God set up a synagogue system to propel the gospel long before the gospel was even being uh, there. So it's amazing. I wonder if Paul connected those things. Yet Saul grew more. Saul and Paul, by the way, just to make sure if anyone's uh, knew Paul and Saul, same name. Paul was his, uh, was his um, Roman name. Saul was his Hebrew name. Uh, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. 
So he's astonishing people. We talked about Paul's background. He was uh, raised in Jerusalem, born in Tarsus. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, raised to be a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, raised to know the law inside and out. Um, after many days had gone by, uh, let's just pause for a second. After many days have gone by, we know from Galatians that he didn't go up to Jerusalem until three years later. So this many days represents a three-year period. So he's been in Damascus for three years, but it also tells us in 2 Corinthians that he was in Damascus, but then he ended up out in the Arabian desert for a long period of time where it seems as though he was mentored taught by Jesus himself through some form of revelation. We don't quite understand it. Paul doesn't get into the huge amount of detail about it, but, but Paul, during these three years, is proclaiming the gospel, and he's also in Arabia somehow reflecting on his theology, developing an argument, and, and coming back, he's confounding uh, the Jewish uh, people as he tells them that Jesus is the Christ. So after many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. Dun, 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 dun. Do you see this happening? They're trying to kill Paul already. They're trying to kill him. Suddenly the person who was persecuting and killing people is now the person being hunted and being persecuted. So he says, day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. We also find out that when reading other uh, verses in Scripture, that the governor and the king of uh, Damascus in that region were plotting, involved in this plot to kill him. And so government is involved, espionage, you know, there's, there's, there's government involved uh, in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. We're going to do a sermon at some point soon on a, uh, I think, on a basket because there are so many illustrations in scripture about a basket. L Moses was floated in a basket. L Bread, you know, overflowing amounts of bread gathered in a basket. Paul being lowered in a basket. Spies being lowered in a basket. It's like baskets are all around the place, but that's another sermon. Uh, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. So, so three years takes place before he gets to Jerusalem. So all of what we just read took three years. When he came to Jerusalem, no one wants to associate with him. They all think he's a spy. Dun, 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 dun. So no one, no one is going to talk to him. And, and we'll spend some more time talking about this guy, Barnabas. But this person, Barnabas, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. We're going to talk more about Paul, so we won't go into detail there. But another time we're going to talk about, I mean, Barnabas. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. Dun, 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 dun. Have you ever had someone wanting to kill you? Yeah. I've, I've had fear, threat of, of my life. I, I remember taking uh, Jeremiah in a car seat, you know, at 2 a.m. To, to my mother's house because someone had threatened my life. Um, Annie, me, Jeremiah, the fear, the feeling that someone seriously wanted to harm you so much so that you had to flee. That, that kind of feeling is something no one should feel. But we're reading in here already of multiple times that Paul's been threatened, his life has been threatened. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea. That's probably where Philip was hanging out at that time. They took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Tarsus was where Paul was born. Tarsus is this huge city, Cleopatra and... Uh, and Anthony had a, you know, they met at Tar in Tarsus. Uh, that was a dating place. Uh, Pompeii, uh, Alexander the Great was in Tarsus. Tarsus was one of the selected few cities in the Roman Empire that was called a free city. They didn't pay taxes. 
They didn't have to pay the Roman tax like everyone else. Anybody want to move to Tarsus? <laughs> no taxes. It was a thriving metropolis. They were known to be, the, the Stoic philosophers were known to, to be gathered there and that, that was a great place of learning, higher education, teaching. And Paul gets sent off uh, to Tarsus. But then they, it says, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Sometimes when we read scripture, we have to ask ourselves, what's not there? What's not there? And so when we look, he says that peace was enjoyed in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Those are the places where Jesus roamed. But it's not where Paul went. It's not Tarsus. Tarsus is, is in Cilicia, further up northeast. Northwest, I'm sorry. Further up northwest. I had to draw the make the picture in my head. We find now that Paul comes back to Antioch uh, after Barnabas goes and gets him, and best calculations is that this time of peace where Paul is in Tarsus is about eight years. So Paul's in Tarsus eight years, and then we find that Paul writes to us some of the things that he's been through in 2 Corinthians. Um, and if we date 2 Corinthians, where he talks about 15 years ago, he was caught up into the third heaven, that's another sermon, where he was kind of discipled by Jesus in some way that I had mentioned. So he dates Corinthians by saying 15 years ago. If you do the math and put that all together, then this list that he lists out in 2 Corinthians uh, 11, 12, happened, most of that happened to his life up to this point. Does that make sense? So let's just look at what Paul went through, the backstory, what we don't always get when we just read it uh, by itself. The backstory is we find in 2 Corinthians that uh, relationships were at risk in Paul's life. Not found in Corinthians is that most Pharisees were required to be married, so many believe that Paul was married. Uh, and yet he talks about not having a wife. And he talks about divorce and allowing for someone who's not a believer in a relationship to be able to leave that relationship. I wonder, I wonder if Paul suffered a divorce because of his mission. I wonder if his wife walked away from the relationship because of the shame, because of the pressure, because of everything that was going on. I wonder if Paul lost his wife in the course of executing his mission. Tells us that he was arrested multiple times. Arrested multiple times. Yeah. I was almost arrested once. Almost. Um, he says that he was beaten more times than he could basically count. Dun, 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 dun. Often in danger of death. Five times he received 39 lashes. This is, he's writing this in 2 Corinthians. That's only midway through his career, not even midway. I believe this is all before his first missionary journey. And he went on three. Five times, 39 lashes. The significance of 39 lashes is that 40 would kill you. So they gave you one less than what would cause death. They stopped, they brought you, they whipped you to the point of one more lash would be death. And he experienced that five times. Dun, 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 dun. Ethan Hunt has nothing on the Apostle Paul. Three times he was beaten with rods. There's multiple ways that it's described. Uh, if Romans, a Roman soldier would beat you with rods by hitting you with a metal pipe on your heels, shattering the bones in your legs. That could have been what Paul went through. 
at the very least, it was a, a heavy wooden stick that he was beaten with. Think of a baseball bat. Spent one night and a day in the deep. We know from his further writings that after his arrest that he was shipwrecked a number of times. This is before that. So he was somehow shipwrecked and spent a night and a day floating in the water. He says this in 2 Corinthians, I've been in danger from rivers. We don't know the story, but we know that he was in danger with rivers, with robbers, with his countrymen, with the Gentiles, in danger from being in the city, being in the wilderness, being on the sea, being in danger from false brethren, from his own brothers that turned out to be fought. That's quite a list. We see this. He talks about many sleepless nights, being hungry and thirsty and without food talks about experiencing cold and being exposed to the, to the elements. And then he says this, mind-boggling. Apart from all of these external things, five times, 39 lashes, three times, beaten with rods, day and the night being floating in the sea, uh, is enemies turning against them. <clears throat> Excuse me, he was stoned once. I'd, somehow that didn't meant get in there, but he was stoned once. Um, and on all of those things, he says, apart from such external things, he also deals with the daily pressure of concern over all of the churches. We know what that's like. We began this service when we started to pray with many of us saying, I have family. I'm concerned about family and friends, and, and we're all concerned about the, the people that are experiencing this hurricane in Florida right now. We're all concerned over their well-being because they are in danger right now. We're experiencing peace and tranquility. Look outside. This is what the church is experiencing in Judea and Samaria and, and uh and Paul in, in Tarsus seems to be in the hurricane. And, and he's planting churches and he's, and he's proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and he's as concerned about the health of them as he is about anything else that's going on in his life. You see, Paul is on a mission. Ethan Hunt was on a mission. You would look at it from a human standpoint of Paul's mission as being mission impossible, and yet something is happening. Something incredible is happening. The, the testimony of his life, the, the, the skill that he has of, of debating the gospel, his knowledge of scripture, all of those things are, are, are all part of his mission, and clearly Paul is on a mission. If you were to ask Paul, you know, we talked last week, and I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm haunted by this. I, I, I was in a, like a huge depression last week, just thinking about the list, because more and more people sent me things throughout the week about why they don't go to church. And it was predominantly Christians who sent me things saying, this is why I don't go to church. And, and, and so I don't go to church because, uh, because I just don't have time. I don't go to church because I don't have uh, the... the I'm not getting fed. I'm not getting anything out of it. I don't go to church because of this. I don't go to church because of that. I wonder what Paul, I wonder what Paul would have said to that. Here's somebody who's on a mission, and he's clearly doing it for a reason. He's not doing it because he just thinks it would be fun. He's doing it because he thinks there's a greater cause out there. He's doing this because he's caring about the lives of the people in the other churches. He's, Paul's on a mission. Paul has a viewpoint of what he's doing. Of He's on a battleship. 
Paul sees it clearly that on a battleship there is a mission. On a battleship there's a destination. On a battleship there are tasks to be done every day that bring you further and further towards the realization of that mission. But it seems to me, and I'm not necessarily talking to anyone in specific, I'm, I'm just saying that the church, the church in general, the church in New England, that's our church. We want to check in. We want great music. We want more hymns. We want less hymns. We, you know, we went through that before. We, we want this. We want that. We just want to be fed. We, don't, we want an earlier start time. We want a later start time. We, we, we want... We want. Imagine going... Can imagine going to the commanding officer on a ship and say, just not getting out of this what I think I want. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> but, and I'm not saying that the church doesn't have aspects of a cruise ship. When we come here on Sunday, we want to enjoy each other's fellowship. We want to recharge. We, we want to have, take, partake of the meal you know, afterwards. We want to worship our God. We want to be able to relax and recharge. But we should never, ever be thinking that we're not on a battleship. God has called us to a mission. God wants us to be in his mission, right? Interesting, I was, I was talking um, with Debbie Arnold this week, and she had come across a meme that said, expecting sinners to come to church is like expecting criminals to report to prison. <laughs> and isn't that funny, though, that the world outside of us that don't come, they view the church more like that. Closed off. You know, they just want to judge me. They just want to, you know, convict me of my guilt. They just want to preach at me. They just want... And so from the outside, the church is looked at as a prison instead of a hospital where people are healed, where people are restored to health, where people are treated with compassion and mercy. Paul's on a mission. We're on a mission. We're all called to be on a mission to bring the gospel to people. We're, we're called to study scripture so that we can apply it and be more Christ-like and go out and change the world and invite the world to come. But, you know, we're not here to be on a cruise ship. We need to think more of a battleship. And, and as we have a battleship, we need to be a mission that brings to light the idea that the church is more of a hospital than it is a prison. How do we do that? We're doing it. We're doing it right now. We're doing it. We're here. We're learning. We're discovering. We're being challenged. We're going to take this out to the rest of the world during the week. And maybe that's a good conversation to say, you know, Hey, the pastor at, at the church that I visited uh, or that I attend saw, showed a picture of a battleship and he said that the church should have a mission to change the world socially without violence but to, but to bring injustice you know, to light. And that a lot of people think of the church as being more of a prison. What do you think? Don't you think the church should be more considered like a hospital? This, it's a great conversation starter. We're on a mission, we're doing it right now. We're recharging to be able to go back out in the battleship mentality. We're, we're, we're fellowshipping together so that when people come, they see us more as a hospital. That's what we're all about. So your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to Understand every day when you wake up that you are involved in Mission Impossible, but then know that with God, all things are possible. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for reminding each of us that we are on a battleship to bring people into the hospital. Lord, that there is a virus called selfishness that is out of control in this world. And your blood, your atoning sacrifice, your gift of life is the cure. May we be mindful of that and may we join in this mission. Help us. There is no way we can do it without you. In Jesus' name, amen.